You have been a very busy man uh, since you arrived, and I, I'd love to spend our time together this afternoon just talking in general about kind of the things you see for opportunities, some of the things you may be worried about, and most importantly, what can we do as alumni to engage with you to better what we, what we love as Fork Union? How were the first couple of months? And you, you just got back into the country. Maybe we should start there. Tell me, okay. tell me where you've been. Well, I arrived here in June after uh, retiring 33 years in the Marine Corps, and I took my wife on a nice round-the-world trip I'd promised her for years. So we were in Italy, we were in London, we were in Paris, Edinburgh. I uh, can't even remember all the places. It was wonderful. And I was already thinking about FUMA, so I was supposed to be on vacation <laughs> before starting my job at FUMA, but I had a notepad. One of the things I wanted to do was try, try to get in touch with the alumni and see how FUMA, the good things that they wanted me to continue at FUMA. I didn't want to change anything right off the bat until I got kind of boots sure. on the ground. Really got a feel from the old guys, from the from the young guys as wait well. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Am I constituted as an old guy now? I, I think we're I think we're probably old guys. <laughs> yeah, old old yeah. guys are guys that we, to our world. got here last year, <laughs> I guess. So then after that, I showed up here and had a good turnover with Admiral Burho. I was really mm -hmm. appreciative for the uh, uh, wisdom that he gave me, and then uh, the board of uh, board of trustees and uh, uh, Miss Pruitt said, just you know, go for it. So I was able to to visit parents of some of our international kids. Okay. I thought that's not something I can do all the time. Right. I've been to Charlotte, been to Richmond, we went to Salem, uh, Virginia Beach, Northern Virginia. We met a lot of the alumni, a lot of the trustees, a lot of prospective um, uh, boys to join, um, but that was easy. Oh, sure. Right, so to get to China is not something you can do all the time. We went to China on one trip, China, Vietnam, and Korea on the same trip. It seemed like it was a year, but I think I was only gone about nine days. <laughs> and your wife is in tow with you. Yeah, I paid for her out of pocket. She, She's she a had, trooper this She one. had not been to some of those places, and she says, hey, I love Fuma, I want to go. So she packed up a, <laughs> a different Fuma shirt for every day, and uh, she loves the boys. She made a calendar online uh, on the computer that has the boys, the international boys from each country on, like, every page and presented that to her parents. Oh, neat. And the parents showed up in China, all these, you know, billions of people, and uh, they showed up at the airport with Fuma shirts on. and uh, What a sight that must have been. Loved the cal it was easy to find them. <laughs> and there they were, um, made the effort. One family drove 14 hours to see us in China. Vietnam, a family wanted to drive me by the old U.S. Embassy because wow. they figured that would be important to me as an American and, and as a Marine to see the Marines there at the U.S. Consulate there in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, formerly called Saigon. And I'm a history buff mm -hmm. and a, a Marine. I love Marines. I still love to talk to every Marine I meet or all the service people and just tell sure. them how much I love them as a retired guy. So we were able to do all that and meet these parents. Parents are so proud of their kids, so proud of FUMA. Went to Korea, wonderful time there. And I met so many nice folks that wanted to come to FUMA. So we think we'll probably go from about 11%, maybe up to as high as 20% really? with international students. They bring a good flavor. Uh, I was able to go to Egypt, Jordan, and the United Arab, Arab Emirates two weeks ago and met parents there. A lot of swimmers from Egypt. We had Ali Kalafala here a few years ago who swam in the Olympics in Brazil, wow. swims for University of Indiana now. His mom and sister came to visit us, drove several hours. And that's one of the neat things about FUMA. So the Chinese kid that can ask about immigration policies to the kid that's from Baltimore or something, right. Hey, what do you think about the president? What do you think about life? What do you think about anything? That, that really adds to a diversity of a school. Not just difference for difference sake, but really a different upbringing, a different worldview, and they come together at FUMA. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, when we were walking over from lunch earlier, you know, it's this idea that you, the, the young man comes into Fork Union lost, confused, hurting in some cases, or just in a little bit of trouble in other cases. Um, but it, it, the experience here is wholly unique, and, and, and it, you know, it does, in a lot of ways, it changes your life. It, it, it does things that, you know, that you can look back and say, you know, I don't know where I'd be today. I mean, that was my case, and yeah. it's interesting when I talk to, I also told you this, I'm an only child, but yet I have a lot of brothers, and they're Fork Union brothers, yeah. and, and that, that feeling never goes away. And it's it's always interesting to me when when somebody new like yourself comes into an environment like this and given given the camaraderie that you've had in your career and the people that you've served with and the places that you've been and the and the things that you've lived through 
to see your responses based on what you've seen here at Fork Union it is wonderful to hear you say that because it is a family here, you know, and it, it's funny. Uh, I've had uh, colleagues and brothers say, well, you know, what's happening to Fork Union? What's going to happen to those traditions? What's going to happen to the place that I kind of grew up in? I, you know, I can't speak for all of the alumni, but what I can tell you is this. Those that have been uh, honorary enough in some cases and, and nice enough in others to, um, to uh, communicate, uh, very excited to have you here. You, you bring a, a great sense of enthusiasm that I think is, again, as we discussed over lunch, we're in a new time and a new place. We find ourselves as, as a school in a very complex world around us. And you said some of these things yourself earlier today that, you know, if you look at some of the traje trajectories that, that military schools are in in the U.S. generally, in spite of the challenges that we might have in front of us, you'd, you'd argue that we're in actually a pretty good place. I think we are. We, you mentioned challenges, and I'll, I'll mention challenges and opportunities. So I think if you saw a graph, it would be sliding off to the right, you know, yeah. that um, military schools may be declining. So I'm starting to see emails, Facebook, things, people calling me saying, what is FUMA all about? Do you pray there? Is it okay to pray? I say, yeah, it's okay to pray. We're good at it. We also pledge the flag standing up. How about that? Might even put our hand on our heart and uh, salute. Right. And we also do physics and throw in some push-ups too. <laughs> they're like, I want that. I want that for my kid. I says, well, bring them to FUMA. We'll see if they're a fit. So when parents save up money for college and say Virginia Tech, UVA, um, Hampton, Sydney, so many great schools in the state of Virginia, public and private, Maryland, North Carolina, Tennessee, and all of our West Virginia, our border states, a lot of great opportunities, but it's an expensive family has to save up for right. in most cases or borrow. Right. So FUMA is about the same price of what some of the colleges right. are. If a family doesn't anticipate that or taxes or a uh, tax deduction for education for primary school. If something like that is not taking place or you can't get a loan for that, parents are not able to do it. And FUMA is not free, it's never been free. You have to pay something. Right. Um, Dr. Hatcher rode around on horseback in Flavana County saying, hey, if y'all give me 50 bucks, I can have this kid go here. And he had a Chinese kid, a lot of people didn't know, we had a Chinese boy here in 1898. That's fascinating. He lived in the house. I live in Dr. Hatcher's house. I live in the president's house. And they say there's a ghost of a Chinese kid up there. <laughs> that might explain the door opening the other night. <laughs> he may explain it. And the kid, at the end of the years here, they ask him, and it's typical Chinese to, to take a big concept and boil it down to something very, very simple, simple, like a fortune yeah, cookie, yeah, right? Yeah. And so apparently they asked this boy, what did you learn in all your time at FUMA? And in English, he said, I learned to be a useful man. That's fascinating, isn't it? And I thought... You know, that's kind of the summation of what you would expect out of a FUMA boy that becomes a man here at FUMA, that he's a useful man, that has a, a, I would, purpose. I, yeah, a purposeful life, a purpose-driven life, called to kind of lead. You know, it's one of the things right. that we use, the called to lead right. campaign, um, and, and to do the right thing. So I think there's great opportunities here, and I think as, as weird as some of these public schools are getting, and I use that, I mean, oh, I really think it's weird. I would agree. And a lot of the homeschoolers, a lot of the parents that are people of faith, and the moms are like, and do you have no cell phones? I said, no, ma'am, no cell phones. <laughs> the this important is, things, We right? don't like the cell phones, <laughs> and we want the push-ups, more the push-ups. So with well, these opportunities we have with the school is a, about 100% historically college acceptance. Right. You know, we don't have quotas. I wish I did. If I was Virginia Tech, uh, VMI in particular, Citadel, I would call us and give us quotas, like give us a fast track, because right. they should know what we do, and I think they do. But... Um, when you're getting a FUMA boy, it's kind of like getting a VMI product. I mean, if you're a business person in Virginia, you, you should know, know, you know, it. you know, don't lie to your still. Right. The UVA honor code is similar. Right. UVA doesn't produce people that are notorious for lying, cheating, and stealing. You know, if you lie at UVA, if you cheat on a test, you're out. Right. And that's policed by their own ranks, by right. the students. So we have something similar to that. I think the colleges know what they're getting. So great opportunities. The challenge remains, though, unless I can continue to get support from alumni, maybe branch out into some grants and some sponsorships, FUMA will continue to be challenged to these people that can't afford it. So, Colonel, that was a very nice segue, which is hence uh, our conversation here today. I think one of the things you're going to find is uh, a great willingness on behalf of the Alumni Association and its members uh, to step up. You know, I came in as uh, association president about a year and a half ago. It's hard to believe. Time flies. Um, 
And it, was, it, it remains a challenge. You know, how do you engage with an alum who's graduated five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, what, whatever the number is? There has to be some compelling reason um, and more often than not, it's, it's really not about writing a check. I mean, don't get me wrong. We'll take your money. Please send your checks. But it's the idea of what can we do to get you back on campus? Because invariably, somebody comes back after 20 years, 25 years, and something happens. They have a, they have a moment that resonates. It's, 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 it's not walking on grass. <laughs> it's, um, you know, uh, walking through the circle and wanting to salute. It, you know, those kinds of things resonate. But we, as an association, have to do a better job. And I think that's one of the great things about this conversation here today is um, I hope we get to do this again. I hope we'll spend some time together talking because I think this is precisely the kind of thing that alumni need to hear and see. It's one thing if I say it, but with you here and to have your input and your ideas, it's great. You know, we, we care about things like tradition. We care about shine shoes. We care about walking and uh, marching in a way that is actually in keeping with what we, I mean, we're still a little mad that you don't buff floors, but outside of that, you know, we're, we're, we're generally good. Um, but you bring up a really interesting point, and I think one of the things that I want everybody out there who's watching to know is we are trying to do a better job with the Alumni Association to do a couple of things. One, become more aligned with what the Board of Trustees is doing, and I can tell you that um, uh, Chairwoman uh, Lester Page is just doing amazing things. To really bring it back home, you know, it's not about trustees doing one thing and alumni doing something else. It's about the idea of us working together. And so you're going to see a coordinated effort whereby, you know, if, if there's some sort of an initiative that they're working on, we want to be in, very close in tow. Because for the very reasons you've just expressed here, we want to be able to be in a position where we can give you the financial tools you need to go out and to recruit those students, whether they be in Baltimore, California, it, it doesn't matter. We know we're falling short on that, but I think this is kind of the beginning of a, of a new phase. And, and as I said to you earlier today, you know, this is a, a very interesting time in the, in the Academy's history, but it's a phenomenal time. And I think we have a real opportunity here to, to affect you, to really make some positive change. Needs to be a complementary approach, certainly not a, a, a competitive approach. Right. You know, we're all part of the FUMA family. Right. Uh, today, as we speak, there's a postgraduate football scrimmage going on, um, and they're doing tryouts. We have 100 college coaches here. These boys last week, they all got a FUMA tie from one of right. the alumni. It's nice enough to give it. Right. Got a FUMA pen. Right. I told these guys one term, two terms, 100 terms, you're a FUMA kid forever. Right. FUMA they family. I said, give us your email that you'll have your FUMA for life. You go out in the world, remember where you came from. These guys are going to try to, if they can, list that they went to high school at FUMA. They may list their other one as right. well, but, but not exclude FUMA. Right. And we've got two Heisman Trophy winners, a Medal of Honor graduate from the school. Not many schools can boast that. Right. And they were all boys in A company, B company, C company, band company, rattan right. rifles, regular FUMA kids. So for these guys, they're probably going to play next fall <laughs> right. on Saturday. And right. one day they're going to be right. playing on Sunday. Right. And they'll remember they came from FUMA and great kids. So a complementary approach between graduates, young and old, uh, parents don't want to leave them out. So parents' council is very important to me, alumni and, and, and trustees and friends of FUMA. Right. And it's relationships that you build with people that they believe in. We've got good buildings here. We've got good facilities. And we've got great kids. That's the FUMA story of these great kids. So that's easy to sell, easy to believe in with all the weirdness that's going on in the world. FUMA is still doing it the old-fashioned way. Right. But embracing technology, embracing diversity, moving forward, but with all those right traditions. So it has to be a complementary approach towards goodness. And that's what we're going to do. That, that's fascinating insight. And it, it, but it makes me think, help me, help me understand what life is like in the barracks today for the average cadet. Because, again, it's changed. Yeah. Uh, again, no, no, no mopping and uh, you know buffing of floors, but you have other things to deal with. I would imagine the cell phone is the bane of your very existence. Is it not? <clears throat> I, I I'm older. <laughs> I I didn't live in the barracks when I was a marine. I was an officer. I lived right. in officer quarters. I went to the officers club, but I inspected the barracks. I was 24 when I came in the Marine Corps, not 18 or 17. So I was always the always the old guy. <clears throat> and even as a platoon commander in Desert Storm with about 65 great young guys, 
I was already looked at as being like a lifer, like a career guy. And um, I could relate to him. So it's harder at 55 to relate to a 13-year-old sure. boy. But it's similar to the Marine Corps in that they're always trying to get away with something. <laughs> they're always gaming me, and I'm trying to game them. So uh, I would think that uh, even though the rules say no cell phones, and we stick to that, I think occasionally some kid's going to hide a cell phone because they want right. to call their mom. Right. Well, you know, we have phones in the rooms now. And then, oh, we had phone banks. Yeah, I remember you, seeing oh, those let things. Let me tell you, that was no fun. 20 degrees in the snow, and yet uh, my first week here, I'm on the phone going, you got to get me out of here. you <laughs> got to get me out of here. So these days they have a phone in the room. Their parents pay for it. At certain times they can pick up the phone and call their mom. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Connect to their mom. Connect to their younger brother, who may be seven foot tall and dunk it. Right. I want that kid to come here. <laughs> to his sister, the one day have beautiful offspring. I'll bring them. No, you know, it's all part of, it's all part of taking care of the kids. And uh, I, I've been through the Marine Corps. We've been through hazing. Right. Uh, we've been through some hard racial times. And some of those things are still a struggle. You call a person by their cadet, cadet Smith. Right. Call them by their name and their rank. And that's what you call them. This isn't a place where we're going to go back to any kind of weird traditions because it wasn't all good in the old days. Sure. Um, they said the boys, you know, they, they used to be able to go to the toilet and that some guy's knees was touch him. Well, hey, man, that's just weird. Yeah, so well, we're I, that happened that. to me. Let okay. me tell you. So, There's yeah. Some of these old things are just, they're just kind of yeah. creepy. Right. <laughs> but the marching, the looking good in uniform, retaining some of the uniforms of the old style, if we can afford them, and they look good and they're durable, well, we're going to do that. We so talk a minute about that because I noticed the, the, they're wearing their BDUs are a tad different than they used to be. Yeah, so things have changed. Even like uh, you'll, you'll look at a VMI, you look at United States Navy, Army, Naval Academy. Some of the traditions will stay the same. Right. Right, but then some just change with the times. The Army and the Marine Corps, we've changed uniforms every few years. Right. They seem to get better and better. Um, the uniform I'm wearing, you don't have to shine the boots. I am no less tough than the guy that fought at Iwo Jima. All credit to those guys in Vietnam and Korea in those areas, but I've won a few too. And I've done it without having to shine boots. It gave me more time to sharpen a knife. It gave me more time to, st it gave me more time to study tactics and weapons and talk to my guys. So I could have been busy shining boots. I could have been busy pressing uniforms. This is wash and wear. The boots don't even have to be shined. Mine. The boys still have shinable boots. There is some discipline in that when you're younger. Right. There's discipline and buff in the floor. There's also, who cares? Just have carpet or something different. Right now, it's more time in the day for the kids to study and have discipline and stuff like team building and reacting to commands and thinking and solving problems. So I keep some of the old traditional uniforms as best I can. We have a letter jacket. The, the kids want to go back to some letter sweater because they saw one in the museum. Oh, no kidding. So I said, well, you make a proposal. We had a, um, I love uniforms, I love history. So we had a uniform pageant uh, two months ago on the 120th anniversary of the school. We had the boys select who they wanted to be historically. Some were real figures like Foots Gregory, the Medal of Honor, guy in a World War I outfit. Others were just somebody from an era. And they had all these old uniforms, and some of them are really a pain. You know, I mean, a $1,500 coat tee with an ostrich plume hat looks cool. We'll keep a few of those for historical purposes and bring them out from time to time. But the parents pay so much money to go to school. I thought it'd be better to have something traditional mixed with something practical. We'll keep some of the uniforms. And, uh, you know, I've looked at some of the yearbooks from years past. Oh, and, uh, I'm curious. <clears throat> I'd like to hear your impressions. Well, you know, there was, there was, it's just different back then. <laughs> so, I mean, the next guy that tells me how great it was back then, we're going to go find his yearbook, and we're going to pull it out, look at his long hair and his bell-bottom-looking liberty attire, you know, when you go away, and we'll see. Uh, even though those black glasses are kind of coming back in style, yeah, they some are. things yeah, yeah, come yeah, back. Yeah. But uh, I, I'll allow the uh, band company will start them back up to wear a beret because you can't you can't yeah, play a lot yeah, of stuff yeah. with a hat, and uh, you get to be special if you do something well. But if you blow it, I'll take it away from. It. I don't wow. have bagpipes now. Right. I just came from VMI, and I love uh, that kind of music, and I think it's a good tradition. It gives boys a challenge, and the sound is unique. It always is. And these old these old military schools of the old days are, are dying, all the time. I mean, there's very few left actually. We're we're unique. Hargrave, Fishburne, some of our brother's schools. I know. Um, uh, and I, I say it that way because I have a complimentary approach with them as well. I want them to do well because I like the military tradition, the military schools. Now, if we play them in sports, I want to cream them, right? 
That's but, another uh, reason we hired you. But I want, um, you know, I have goodwill to all those guys. But some of them, like, um, I think it was Carson Long Clothes, they were older than we are. Mm -hmm. And they closed this year, completely done. Um, a lot of competition with other private schools, some kind of niche schools, like some are more outdoor adventure, some are more academic. I think FUMA is just the right thing for, for certain kids. you got to be the right fit. So we'll keep doing things the old-fashioned way and grade a little more technology. I want to start a UAV club, an unmanned aerial vehicle club, a drone club. Mm -hmm. could be a small quadcopter. Why? It's just fun to do it for one. Two, it has something to do with robotics and remote control. You can do most of them with an iPhone now. Right. Well, we're not going to do that. Or I may, I may make a way that we can do it just for that. But there's other ways you can control mm -hmm. it. But there's civilian applications for that, military applications Absolutely. for that. That's all problem solving. And uh, there's going to come a time where it's unacceptable to put a human being in a toxic environment. Right. You know, to go underneath right. and breathe, it, breathe in fumes or to move cargo around. It's going to be done with robots. And it's going to be monitored by other robots by a human being. So that and maybe an underwater unmanned vehicle club. There's certainly applications for that in my previous job in the military. We're always looking for a smart young man or woman who can solve problems and use the technology to do it. You could have an obstacle course. Imagine with, I want somebody needs to build me an obstacle course. I'll build it myself. But well, we, don't have a, we don't have an <laughs> obstacle course on this campus, and it's a military school. The M is for the military at FUMA. FUMA with an M. Well, I think we all military heard that. That, says that, it right that strikes there. me as a challenge. It says it right there, <laughs> military. So I come on the campus here. My mind, body, and spirit needs it, needs some military, and I don't see an obstacle course. I need that. I like to have a trap and skeet range start mm -hmm. up again. We have uh, the Red Arrow uh, on the Outdoor Life channels. My next door neighbor, a FUMA graduate, uh, Red Pulliam. Yep. You know, family connection there. He could help us out. There's other alumni who can help us out. Parents who can help us out. Um, I want to win in what we do. I want to do it with class and give the boys some challenge. Boys need a challenge. They want a challenge. And so we don't need to become the United States Marine Corps. <clears throat> We're not going to fire live weapons in training. We might have trap and skeet, but right. you can do that under control. Right. And, uh, and that give the boys a challenge if that's what they want to do. Our scout troop is back up and active. Good. I want to I see Eagle Scouts. Good. Because there's a lot of goodness in that. And... Um, just keep moving forward. I actually see us growing, and I don't think it's just positive thinking. I think it's positive action, and I think people are going to want to be part of us. If a parent has the money and there is discounting, and we do have a trustee scholarship that pays for everything. Right. So there could come a time and a place where we have such an endowment that FUMA is free for every kid. That could be in the horizon. I think Dr. Hatcher would have liked that, but he said things cost money. At the end so, of the day. So, right. so, so yeah, somebody has to pay. So some kind of a way in the future we could allow some of the kids to come here a little bit more of a discount, still cover costs, and do all the great things FUMA is doing is one of the things I'm excited about. So you bring up an interesting point. Um, as, as you maybe kind of look out, at, you know, five years from now, seven years from now, whatever the case may be, what challenges do you see in front of us? And, and are they manageable in your eyes, your opinion? Great question. Challenges. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, <laughs> challenges. I mean, this is what I get paid to think about, to, con to come up with a strategy. You know, there's techniques, tactics, and procedures we say in the military can solve the problem. But if you don't frame the right problem, you're solving the wrong problem and creating another right, problem. Right. So the strategic long-term view here is to keep the facilities in good shape, which is always a challenge. You know, right. it would be with any university or any town manager, you know, an old coal plant. Right. How do you convert it? So uh, we're, we're, we're pretty good in that. A healthy endowment, a healthy good pull from typical families that come to FUMA will send sons here right. and grandsons here. Challenges, interesting new people that are saving that money for college. You have to make the argument for a family if you front in your, your investment, perhaps. So to get them into the good college, perhaps you need college prep. Right. Perhaps you need to live in a dormitory-style environment, the barracks. Right. Perhaps you need to have a safe environment. I think that attracts a lot of parents. School shootings, right. the bullying, which, you know, in our generation, maybe a guy said something to you, you meet him at the bus stop and slug him, you know? Yeah, these, days, these days, I think if you hit somebody like that, the bus stop would be assault and battery, you'd be in jail. Right. But then they'd, they'd, they'd pester you on Facebook. They'd pester you on Instagram. They'd pester you on Twitter or on Yik Yak or all these different things they have that you can't get back at them. You know, that hurts. My generation was sticks and stones, or break your bones, or words will never hurt you. I never bought into that because words did kind of hurt. Right. But, you know, I, you could get through it, I guess. But 
I think there's this bullying thing really hurts. We teach a class on that. The big thing to do is is, is to build their self confidence. I think at Fuma you can build your self confidence. Like we're we're attuned to that, and there are some challenges here. And my heart breaks for these kids that don't have the confidence. But I told you about the one kid. I said, "Are you going to quit on yourself?" I was going to give you a leadership position, put you in charge of three other kids because they need you, because I need them to learn and grow. And you're the kind of guy that's stubborn enough to redirect that. <laughs> and he says, well, who are these kids? I said, I don't know. I just made it. I just, I just, any kids. <laughs> so I said, I'll come up with some names or work with your tack right. and in your company. And I challenge you to be a leader. He goes, if they need me, I'll, I'll stay and I'll, I'll help them. I can do that because I want, I want them to be good and it's a good opportunity. And he's making the speech to me. I'm sitting behind my desk in the president's office. Yeah, your work office. here is done, right. I, I said, it, I, I think it. I'll just go home early. <laughs> so, and those are the kind of stories I love. Um, I had a great life. I had challenges and I uh, had people help me and uh, thank God for that. So it's time to pay it back. I, you know, maybe, in, uh, maybe to wrap this thing up, because uh, I know we've been at it for a while. Do you have any other sort of parting thoughts or any other uh, gifts of wisdom that you would like to share with parents, alumni, or our existing cadets? I'd like to say thanks. I'm very happy to work here. Thanks thanks to God for FUMA, what it stands for, and for the boys. Um, The boys are FUMA. And probably the best salesman I have is just the boys themselves. And um, they are a thankful bunch. And they work hard. They have a long day. I'm not going to take it easy on them. But I, I tell them thank you, and they tell me thank you. They really mean it. <clears throat> I love the country. I love my state. I'm a native Virginian, and I'm thankful to be back in Virginia with these boys. They're our future. Our future is in good hands. Colonel, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have this opportunity to sit with you today. I think this is the beginning of a wonderful relationship, and uh, we wish you the absolute best. And please know that uh, the Alumni Association and uh, my brothers, We'll be here. You just tell us what, what you need, and we will be here for you. Well, thanks. Go FUMA. Yeah, go FUMA.